The following is a presentation of Castleview Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Babies don't come with instructions. Have you heard that line before? That's what they say, and it's true. They don't. First-time parents are often told that, and first-time parents might read books, articles, might take a 12-week class, talk to parents, talk to others who have young kids, do everything they can to prepare for parenthood. But inevitably, they come into situations early and often where they face something they didn't read about, or if they did read about it, all the answers they were given just aren't working. You have a wife who says to her husband, what do we do? And the husband says, I don't know. And you reach out for help. Maybe you contact your own parents. Talk to the grandparents. And they say, well, try this. And you say, we already tried that. And eventually, after going around for a while, the grandparents maybe will say, you know, we don't know. After all, babies don't come with instructions. And they hang up the phone. And you're left to live with your child. Eventually, new parents adjust to life with a baby. But not knowing what to do is a recurring experience for parents. And that's true for Christian parents too, just like everyone else. But even though we might not always know what to do, we don't always know how to solve sleepless nights or drama that we hit in middle school, we, we don't always have the answers, we do have instructions, at least about the biggest, most important things from God. And our passage this morning is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. You can turn there now. Uh, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. It's a passage that's directed first to children and then to their parents. So if you fall into one of those categories, if you are someone who lives under parents or you are yourself a parent, listen up. Because God's word is giving you your job description this morning. So if you're, if you're a, a child or you're a student, the reality is a lot of people are going to tell you what you should be like, right? What you should do. And there are a lot of different messages you're hearing from friends, classmates, social media. You're getting a lot of different messages and it can be confusing. Man, what kind of person should I be? What kind of person do I want to be? And many of those same things are true for parents. A lot of people will tell you what kind of parent you should be. If you've ever asked for parenting advice on Facebook, you know what I'm talking about. You're going to hear a lot of input. There's a reason that articles on mommy guilt get a lot of hits every time. That's because so many of us feel bad for falling short of all the things you think you're supposed to be to be a good parent. So whether you're a child of parents or you're a parent, you have this morning instructions from God. Instructions from God about what kind of person to be in this role that God's given you. So use this morning to, to turn down some of the static of the confused and often confusing messages about what you should be and what, how you should act, what you should do. Focus in on what God wants of you. Uh, just like we said in the passages on marriage, if you're not in one of those categories, you say, well, I'm, I'm not a child or at least not a child in my parents' home right now or I'm not a parent of children, I would still encourage you, don't check out. For one, you've got other parents and children in your lives who need your help and your encouragement to be faithful in the roles that God's called them to. But I think also it's helpful to get some what we might call cross-disciplinary exposure you know, I'm, I'm a pastor, but I'm helped when I read or listen to people who are in different vocations, different backgrounds. They have different roles and responsibilities. I'm helped as they describe how they approach their lives and their jobs. And I'm often struck with similar things that I can learn and apply in my own role. Right? And I think you might find the same thing as you listen in on what God is speaking first to children in the home and to their parents. So as Christians, we're all called to live out our new life in Christ, and, and we can grow as we consider what that looks like in ourselves, but also in others. Ephesians chapter 5 sets up the context for our verses this morning. 
So I'm going to reread chapter 5, verse 15 through 21. God's word says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So to be filled with the Spirit, we're rejoicing in song, we're thankful in our hearts to God, and we're submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he lays out these three relationships that are examples of what that submission and leadership look like. So we've already looked at wives and husbands. We're going to jump ahead now to chapter 6, children and parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. First, children. I don't want, to, I don't want you to miss the fact, all right, especially if you're a student or you're, you're a child still in the home, I don't want you to miss the fact that God's word right here addresses you uniquely and specifically. It says, children, this book was a letter that was read in local churches like this one. That's what Paul sent it to one church to be shared with others, and they shared it around that area, around Ephesus and Asia Minor, and they read it aloud, and most of the letter just applies to everyone in the church, but now he's addressing certain groups, and one of those groups is children. So this is addressed to you. We're going to talk about who a child is here in a moment, but students, kids, listen up to what God's Word says. It's a good thing to get together with God's people and listen to what He has to say. And Paul expects, when he writes this, that children are going to be in there, in the church, along with adults, listening to God's Word. So if you're a student or a child and you come along with your parents to church, you don't maybe come on your own yet, but you're brought here or strongly encouraged to be here, I wonder if you ever feel like, you know, church isn't really for me. It's it's really for adults, and, and they're glad that we're here, but we're just kind of along for the ride. If you ever feel like that, these verses are expecting that children will be gathering with the church, hearing the Bible read, taught, preached, joining in the songs and the prayers. So church is a time for God to speak to you, just like the rest of us. Well, who are these children? What age or stage of life? We, we recognize even in our own English that we sometimes struggle to, we talk about a child, we think of someone who's young, but then you're an adult child of your parents. It also reflects relationship. Well, the, the focus here is, is probably primarily on those who are still dependent on their parents. All right, Paul assumes that they're old enough to listen and to understand what he's saying. It's probably not geared at infants. But he's also not focusing first on adult children. Look at verse 4. It talks about fathers bringing them up. These are children who are still being raised by their parents. They've not left home. They've not become independent. All right, they're almost certainly not married. We saw up in chapter 5, verse 31, that getting married means leaving father and mother and being united, joined to a spouse. So these instructions are most clearly focused on those who still live at home under their parents' authority. So if that's you, listen up. God's telling you how to live for him right now in this stage of life. And, and what he says is, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. What does that mean? What does it mean to obey? As a starting point, it means you do what they say to do. You don't do what they tell you not to do. We say in our house, obedience is doing what were you told right away and all the way with a good attitude. At least that's the goal. Right away, all the way with a good attitude. Maybe you, you're a kid, you're, you're a student, and you hear a lot about God. You hear about him at church. Maybe you hear about him at home. You hear about him on the radio or you're... you're reading books about him. 
and you know that you're supposed to love God and there's there's this stuff that the Bible talks about that's important and you think about it maybe when you're in class or at youth group or with your parents. And then you've got your life, all the regular stuff. You're going to school, you're eating meals, you have to do some chores, you're playing video games, you're hanging out with your neighbors, you're doing all that regular stuff and it's hard to know how to live for God all the time. How do those things connect? What does it even mean to live for God when I'm doing those regular things. I think here's a good place to start. Loving God and living for him means obeying your parents. Now it says to, to obey them in the Lord. Who's in charge of everything? Right? God is. God made everything. He's in charge of the universe. He decides how things are. He decided that you would be born where you'd be born, and he decided who your parents would be, and he put them in charge of you. So if you're going to obey God, that means you're going to obey your parents. How you then respond to your parents and to their authority is how you are responding to God's authority. So if you ever think, man, I can't stand my parents. They're so annoying. They're so unfair. Oh, God, yeah, I mean, I love God. Or if you think, man, I'm, I'm really sold out for God. I live for him. But you disobey your parents pretty much all the time. If you live that way or you think that way, I think you're tricking yourself. Because the main way you obey God as a child is by obeying your parents. Now, if your parents ever tell you to do something that's wrong, according to God, or if they ever hurt you, those are different situations. Right? So if that ever happens, if your parents tell you to do something, you think, I think that's actually wrong, or if they hurt you, you should talk to another adult. Talk to a teacher or a pastor or someone else at church. Those situations are different. But the rest of the time, you obey God by obeying your parents. Now, we're still in this verse to children, but I want to say a word to parents here. Parents, you need to hear this. You are your child's God-given authority. In verse 4, we're going to get instructions about how to use that authority rightly. But there's no question about whether or not you are the rightful authority. All right, your authority as a parent is clearly implied because here it's assumed and understood that parents are in charge. So it just jumps ahead to how you use that authority. Because it's not even questioning whether or not you have that authority. And parents, we today need to be reminded of this. What might have been assumed back then is not assumed today. Your job as a parent is to lovingly, wisely exercise the authority that God's given you over your children. You must not do it in the wrong way, but you must not fail to be the parent. All right, so in marriage, we talked about, hey, you know, this, this relationship, which is different. There are different types of authority, different types of submission. And I pointed out to husbands, we don't see the command to make sure your wife gets in line or make sure she submits. Proverbs, we do read about it. It's difficult to live with a quarrelsome wife, but, but then we don't see husbands told, get them in line. That's not what biblical headship looks like. But parenting is a different type of authority. Parents are called to require obedience of their children. So if you're a parent, don't back down from that right? Back down from sinful, selfish leadership. We'll talk about that later, but don't back down from the fact that you're called to lead. Proverbs assumes that you will enforce what you've taught them. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your son for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. So you, as a parent, are right to give your children instructions and then to enforce what you've said. It looks different at different stages, right? It's not the same with a 4-year-old and a 14-year-old. And we don't have time in this sermon to get into all of that. I'd encourage you to come to parenting classes when they're offered. Talk to other Christians in your fellowship group or other members here at Castleview for how to work that out. But you are to give instructions and then to enforce what you've said. Do it lovingly. Do it patiently. But do it confidently. Do it confidently because when you act like the authority that you really are, 
you're not just standing on your own and being selfish. You are coming under God's authority. You're doing what he's called you to do. I often tell my kids, I help make you obey because that's how I obey God, right? You're under me, but I'm under God just like you are. So if I don't teach you to obey, if I always let you get away with disobeying, then I am actually disobeying God myself. Not only this, do it confidently because you're under God's authority, but also do it confidently because your loving authority is not harmful to your child. It is loving. It is what is best for them. When you require obedience, it's good for you. That's true, right? It it can, over time, make life better for you. But more importantly, it's good for them. And generally speaking, it leads to a life of blessing for them, as we're going to see verses 2 and 3. When we get here to verses 2 and 3, Paul shows that his instructions go along with what God's people have known for centuries. And in many Old Testament passages, we see children are under their parents' authority. And that's true even in the Ten Commandments, where now he quotes the Fifth Commandment. Look there at verse 2. Honor your father and mother. And then he highlights that it comes with a promise. He says, this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. You think back from Paul's day, which in many ways is like ours because it's after Christ has come. Well, Paul, you go back 1,500 or so years before that, and you have the people of God, the Israelites, who are about to go into the promised land, and they receive from God the law, the Ten Commandments, and then you had other case law beyond that, the law of Moses, which laid out for them what it would look like to live rightly before God. The God who had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. We already heard that in Deuteronomy 6. He said, I've, I've loved you. I've rescued you. I've brought you into relationship with myself. Here now is how you should live. And if they disobeyed the law, what would happen? They would receive God's punishment. What, what they talk about is covenant curses. Right? They're in a relationship with God, in a covenant. And if they disobeyed, there would be these problems, these curses, this punishment. But if they obeyed the law, they would then enjoy covenant blessings in that land, that special, unique land of blessing. Well, in the fifth commandment, it highlighted that Israelite children who honored father and mother would be blessed. They'd be blessed with a long life in the land that God was giving them. Well, now we fast forward 1,500 years, and Paul's writing to a mainly Gentile audience. They're not Jewish. They're not the biological descendants of Abraham, and they don't live in that promised land. They live in Asia Minor, and yet he still includes the promise when he says that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land, although he drops off that phrase about it being the land that the Lord your God is giving you. What's happening here? Now that Christ has come, some things change, some things remain the same. So under the new covenant that we have through Christ, we are all one in Christ. Right? Ephesians chapters 2 and 3, we are one in Christ. Jew, Gentile, we all different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different life circumstances. We are one in Christ. And the covenant blessings that we enjoy, right, they're not centered now in this land of promise, but in Jesus Christ. And if we're united to him, what do we have? You remember the first verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 1? We enjoy every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. But even though the old covenant is not in effect in the same way, binding over us as law, many of the truths, many of the principles in the law are timeless, which isn't too surprising because it comes from God who is timeless. And in the new covenant, children who honor their parents, now they're not supposed to, you know, go move to the Middle East to get that long life that was promised back in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But Children still can expect that life will go better for them if they honor their parents than if they don't honor them, right? It's not a guarantee of old age or of material blessing, but God has set up his world in a way that obedience leads to blessing. That is generally true in this life. It's always true in eternity, right? You think of the, the Proverbs when we read those, that's, that's a good guide for them. They are generally true in this life, and they are always true in eternity. Well, what's the difference between obedience and honoring? Well, they're very closely related. Obedience 
is the action that comes from the attitude of honor and respect. So you have the bigger, broader command to honor. And if you honor your parents, then you're going to obey them while you're under their authority. So I think that direct obedience passes away, right? We, we don't, most of us, and I think it's good and right at 40, have our parents look to them to give us direct instructions of what to do with our lives. No, now we have left that direct authority and obedience. But honor and respect should always be given no matter the age or stage of life. So what does that look like? What does it mean to honor father and mother? Well, I think when you're under their authority, it starts with obedience. I think it looks like not talking down to them as if they need you to teach them. It means speaking respectfully to them and speaking respectfully about them when you're talking about them to others. As an adult child, this is true. I think it includes as an adult seriously considering their counsel. And probably better yet, not just waiting for them to offer input, but showing that you respect their opinions by asking for their advice, expressing to them that you think highly of them, expressing ways you appreciate them. You know, disrespect and dishonoring of parents is so common today, you might not even notice it. It might not even catch your attention when someone makes fun of their parents, rolls their eyes at them, tell other people how dumb they are, yell at them. I mean, that's considered pretty normal stuff. But cultural acceptance is not the same as divine acceptance. And just because something's normal for us or feels normal today doesn't make it okay with God. You think about cultures where it's normal and acceptable to engage in race-based slavery or adultery or polygamy or child abuse or all these other things that we would pretty much all universally say, that's not good, that's not okay. But those cultures say it's okay. Well, that doesn't make it okay, right? The same is true today with disobeying, dishonoring parents. And if you ever feel like, man, disobeying parents, though, I mean, that's kind of a small sin compared to the really big ones. Listen to what one New Testament passage says, Romans chapter 1. It's listing all these sins, these people who have turned against God, who have been given over to idols. It says, verse 28, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. Oh, wow, these people are bad. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Now, the Bible explains that we have all engaged in these things. We have all turned against the God who made us. We've chosen to go our own way. That's what the Bible means when it's talking about sin. Now, maybe you're, you're someone who you think, I haven't done a lot of those big sins. I know I, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but I'm pretty good most of the time. I mean, at least compared to a lot of other people. But God's word reveals that our definitions of sin and our feelings about whether or not I'm really all that bad don't always, don't often line up with God's standard. And if he's in charge, his standard is really the only one that matters. It defines reality. And according to God, all sin is serious because it's rejecting him. So our rebellion toward our parents is not a small thing. It's just a demonstration of our rebellion against our God who made us. Our dishonoring of our parents is not a small thing. It's just showing that we dishonor God. Which is why Jesus came. He came to die in the place of those who would turn to him, who would trust in him, away from their sin. He paid for our sins, even sins like envy and murder, disobedience to parents, all those sins. We finally get to verse 4 here. It says, instructions for parents, specifically for fathers. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, the word here for fathers could be translated parents, but most translators agree that fathers is 
pretty, pretty likely the, the right translation. Everything in this verse would apply to all parents. But it's focused first at dads. Dads, don't miss the fact that you, according to God, have the greatest parental responsibility. You are responsible for the moral and spiritual direction of your home. So don't try to get out of that. If it's something that God has given you, don't try to shirk it. Don't try to give it to your wife or to anyone else. It's on you. Now, it starts with what not to do. It says, don't provoke your children to anger. Some translations say, don't exasperate your children. In the book of Colossians, Paul gives similar instructions. He says, fathers, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Parents, your children are accountable to God, right? Children, you are accountable to God for your actions. Children have enough corruption in their sinful nature to mess them up, even with the best parents. Good parenting does not always result in godly children. But our parenting does affect them and shape them in many profound ways. And if you're a parent and you have a child who's regularly angry or exasperated or frustrated or discouraged, I'm not saying you individually caused all that, but you should consider, we should consider, how has my leadership been contributing to that? I want to I list four paths to exasperating your children or provoking them to anger. Four paths to exasperating your children. One, neglect them. Don't give them too much time and attention. Subtly send the message that there are a lot of other things that are more important in your life than they are. I think this happens when you take every opportunity to be away from them, to be away from home, for work, for hobbies, just to get out of the house, do your own thing, be with friends. You send those messages. And it also happens when you're physically present but emotionally absent. And when you have children who are maybe trying to engage you, to talk to you, and you're focused on other things, and in that moment, they are a distraction. They are an interruption of what you're trying to do. And now I'm in the place of treating what God says are blessings as inconveniences, because that's what they feel like. They're getting in the way of what I deem more important at that moment. As they get older, they're going to be able to tell when you feel or act that way, if they don't already. So neglect them. Another path to exasperating them, indulge them. Don't give them boundaries or rules. Try not to say no, you know, if you need to distract them, but don't, don't directly tell them no, because they don't want to hear that. Try to make them feel like they're always in control. Try to give them what they want. When you parent that way, you are reinforcing your child's natural perspective. I'm the center of the universe. All things revolve around me. Spoiled kids are not happy kids, right? If you try to give your kids what they want all the time, ironically, they won't be happy. They won't feel like they have what they want a lot of the time because your supply can never keep up with that demand. You can never give enough to satisfy, and to make them happy. And even if you could, for the most part, keep them happy, which I don't think you can, even if you could for a while, you're setting them up for frustration later because other people are not going to cater to them the way that you might. They're going to meet friends, teachers, employers who tell them no. And they might feel like something strange is happening to them when that happens, if they've not heard that before, or at least not very much. So neglect them, indulge them. Third path to exasperate your children, be unpredictable. Be unpredictable and inconsistent. This happens especially with correction and discipline or consequences. Unclear communication and inconsistency leave children guessing. They don't know what to expect. They don't know how you're going to react. Right? Instead of this, give clear instructions, clear expectations, and then stick to them. Because if you don't follow through, your children aren't going to take instruction seriously or they're going to try to figure out, man, when do they really mean it? When does mom or when does dad really mean it? And that's a red flag if you're having to say things like, I really mean it this time. 
right? That's a red flag that most of the time it's not clear to you or to them that you really mean it. Because then when you do follow through, it's going to surprise them. It's going to seem harsh. It's going to seem unfair. Remember that the goal of correction is to please God, not your child. And it's to love your child, not yourself. The goal of correction is to please God and love your child. And if you remember that, then your correction, your consequences, your discipline isn't going to just be based on your mood or on what you can handle at that moment. It's going to be based on what is best for your child. So whether or not a behavior bothers you isn't really the point. It doesn't bother me for my own sake if I tell a child to set the table and they just don't do it. Like, I can probably do it better. I can do it faster. It doesn't really bother me. It doesn't mess up my life. I'll just let that go. No, for their sake, I'm going to require them to obey. Or on the other hand, it does bother me when maybe they spill their milk and it creates a big mess for me. And I'm tempted to be angry and respond that way. But it was just an accident. It's just the type of thing that I do sometimes. We don't correct. We don't parent based on my mood or what I can handle but on what God says and what is good for my child. Fourth path to exasperating your child, be harsh with them. Give unreasonable expectations where you're never really satisfied with how they've responded. You never praise them for what they've done right. You're always ready to point out what wasn't quite good enough about what they've done. Along with that often comes degrading speech, tearing them down. Your words are powerful. All words are powerful. You find that in James. But parents' words are especially impactful. You might remember things that were said to you by a parent decades ago that still echo in the back of your minds. Parents, stay away from degrading speech toward your children. Sinful anger when they haven't met my expectations, which can lead to excessive and sinful discipline. Sometimes maybe it's not active discipline, it's long, repetitious lectures where you tell them the same thing they've heard before, probably longer than they need to hear it. You don't engage them in conversation. You don't ask them questions to try to draw them out. You just go into lecture mode and it lasts for a long time. That's a way to exasperate your children. When you do this, you also usually will fail to listen to them. We don't want to give in to excuses for sin. But we do want to empathize with them when they are expressing in different ways that it's hard to obey. It is hard. If you're you're under your parents' roof and you think, man, it's hard to obey, that's true. It's hard. Right? There's, there's There's a big part of me that's like, I'm glad I'm not in those shoes anymore. Now, there are other challenges about being a parent, and life will get much more difficult in many ways. But it is hard to obey. It's hard to do the right thing. Parents, recognize this. Listen to your children. Maybe the, one of the most damaging ways of harshness is having a double standard. Do what I say, not what I do. It's really hypocrisy. I'm going to hold you to a standard that I never live to myself. And along with that, never admitting your sin. One of the quickest ways to gospel parenting is to admit and confess your sin to your children. Whenever you have the opportunity to do that. What's the positive alternative to exasperating your children, provoking them to anger? It says, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Who's going to do this? Who's going to regularly, repeatedly guide your children to God's truth? Parents, it's our job. It's our job from God. This is our commission. These are our marching orders to train and instruct our children in the ways of the Lord. It's not a job you can outsource, not responsibly. It's not up to youth pastors and Sunday school teachers or Christian schools to do this for you. If you're a parent, it's your job to train your children, to correct them when needed, to point them to God, to expose them to his word. So what are you doing to make this happen? Parents and especially dads, how are you actively working to bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? As you think about that question, or if you'd have a conversation with someone else, you should be able to to come up with concrete things that you're doing toward this end. 
I'd encourage you to find the time in the day to, to gather your family together at least a couple times a week, maybe even every day. That'd be great, but maybe you start with once a week, twice a week. Gather your family together for a short time to read from God's Word and pray and keep it simple. All right, no matter how well or poorly it seems like it goes, just the act of intentionally reading and praying together and tuning out other distractions shows them, communicates to them, that you believe God is real. He's important. You show that you need God's grace just like your children do. If you've never done this, but you want to start, I would encourage, talk to to a pastor, talk to another Christian parent. I'd love to give you a lot of good ideas and resources about how to do this in simple ways. You could start this tomorrow or this afternoon. Prioritize this. But I think in addition to structured times, parents must look for opportunities to bring biblical truth to bear on daily life, daily conversations. Remember what we read earlier, Deuteronomy 6? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love him with everything. And then what does he say? These words that I command you shall be on your heart. It shall be on your heart. Well, what happens when these words, these truths from God are on your heart? heart, when you actually love him personally, well, then you'll be set up to teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, all the time, everywhere. Look for opportunities to connect real life with who God is and what he's doing. This can be difficult. I think think it's probably easier to do regular family devotions than to engage children in everyday talk about God. At least it is for me. To do that requires more of us because we have to be engaged with our children and we ourselves have to be learning and growing. It's hard to give what you don't have. You know, if you want your children to know God, probably the best thing that you can do is to draw near to God yourself. Be a real Christ follower. And then as you do that, teach them what you're learning. If all you think as a parent is, oh yeah, I have these values that I'm kind of just supposed to pass on to the next generation, maybe it'd be good for them to be in church. What what am I supposed to be teaching them so that they know it, so I can feel good that I've been a good parent? I I think you're missing the heart here. The heart here is I know God. I love him and I have new life in him. So I want to live for him. And that includes pointing them to the same gracious father that I have. Parents, now is the time to give attention to how you raise your children. Don't neglect this calling. What you put off today will only get harder. Frederick Douglass said, It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken adults. Maybe you're someone who feels broken because your dad or your parents didn't care for you like this. Or maybe you're still at home and you feel like, Yeah, I don't get this kind of parenting. And they're not bringing me up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And, and they give me all kinds of reasons to be angry. Maybe that happened in your childhood. You're still dealing with the effects. Maybe you're a parent who feels overwhelmed with your present responsibility on top of your past failures. Maybe you feel like, man, my kids are out of the house now. It's, it's too late. I've messed up. Look back at Ephesians 5.1. It says, therefore... Be imitators of God as beloved children. If you are in Christ, you are one of God's beloved children. Look back at chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. You are God's adopted child if you are in Christ by faith. So regardless of where you are in your parenting or how you've been parented, remember who your father is. Remember what he's like. Because God is not only the model father that we should imitate, which he is. He also is actually our father. Father. He's not just like a father that we can 
follow after him. He is a father who perfectly cares for his children. If you're in Christ, he is a father who has brought you to himself and you are forever in his loving care. I want to close with these words from Psalm 103. You can listen or you can turn there yourselves. In a moment, we're going to, we're going to transition to the Lord's Supper where we're, we're celebrating, we're remembering a father who sent his own son to die for rebels, to die for those who'd rejected him so that we could become his children. And now that we are his children by faith in Christ, listen to what kind of a father he is. Psalm 103, starting in verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Let's pray. This has been a presentation of Castleview Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church, please visit castleview.org.